Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Whitaker, and today I want to talk about a symptom of trauma that no one talks about, and that's anhedonia. Anhedonia is also known as emotional flatlining, and it's the inability to feel joy or pleasure, or it's a dulling or blunting of the experience of joy or pleasure. When you are doing or experiencing something that you used to enjoy, and are no longer able to feel that joy. That's called anhedonia. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Whitaker, trauma specialist, empowerment strategist, and shadow guide. And I want to welcome you to my community or welcome you back to my community if you're already a member. Please like, share, subscribe. And on YouTube, be sure to hit that bell because my videos all interrelate. And I'd hate for you to miss something. So let's jump back in. Anhedonia is most commonly associated with depression or major depressive disorder, and that's actually a pretty limiting perspective of what anhedonia is. You don't have to be depressed to experience anhedonia, especially in this day and age. It also affects individuals living with other conditions such as PTSD, complex PTSD, bipolar disorder, and addiction, for example. For some folks, spending too much time online while also isolated in their homes, which gives us that faux sense of connection, but it's not actually social engagement, can lead to signs and symptoms of anhedonia. In addiction recovery, some people experience what's called stuck in sobriety or stuck in recovery. And this is when a person is no longer using a substance or no longer participating in a behavior if it happened to be a behavioral addiction, and yet they still don't feel any happier. They're still just as angry and frustrated and numb and disconnected and lacking that pleasure and joy as they were before when they were using or participating in the behavior that was addicting. Anhedonia is distressing to experience because the things that you used to enjoy feel out of touch. You just can't, can't grab onto them anymore. And it's difficult to engage with other people when a person is experiencing anhedonia. There are two main types of anhedonia. The first one is social anhedonia. And with social anhedonia, the individual lacks interest in spending time with other people and no longer wants to engage with friends or family. It can make relationships a struggle, and it's hard to get motivated to attend social events and be around people. If you're experiencing anhedonia, you may find yourself turning down invitations, skipping milestone events like weddings, bar mitzvahs, holiday gatherings, or reunions. And the reason you're telling yourself that you're not going to go is, I don't see any benefit. What's the use? Why take part in that anymore? Social anhedonia may be confused with social anxiety because avoiding social situations is a common overlapping symptom. However, the underlying motivation or impetus is very different. The second type of anhedonia is physical anhedonia. And with physical anhedonia, the person no longer enjoys physical sensations such as touch, taste, or smell. Hugs may no longer feel nurturing. Foods might just taste bland and sex loses its appeal. Signs and symptoms of anhedonia include the following. Social withdrawal and avoiding social situations with friends, family, neighbors, and colleagues. Fewer relationships. You might find yourself avoiding romantic relationships if you're single or pulling away from current relationships, isolating and, and just retreating within yourself. You might experience uncomfortable or unpleasant emotions toward others and toward yourself. And this might include being incredibly judgmental and overly critical of others in yourself inside your head or coming up with reasons why you just don't want to be around them. You might have a narrower window of tolerance, which is less emotional range. And if you're not sure what window of tolerance is, I do have a video on the topic. I will make sure I link it in so you can um, circle back to that if you're not sure. And having a lower window or a narrower window of tolerance might present as having fewer verbal or nonverbal expressions. 
And so feeling fewer emotions, you might feel less sympathy, less empathy, less joy, compassion, and that can lead to that blank or unemotional facial expression on a person's face. People with anhedonia are more likely to fake their emotions and pretend that they're fine, they're good, they're happy, everything's great when you're around them, but really inside, they know that they're not happy and they're just like passing off that they're a lot better than they really are. People with anhedonia have little, if any, interest in sex and, sex and physical intimacy. And it's common for people with anhedonia to have more physical ailments than most. Um, they might get sick and catch every little cold or little bug that goes around. Now, keep in mind that not everyone presents with anhedonia in the same way. Some people develop an inability to experience joy and pleasure, while others might experience joy and pleasure, but it's dulled or blunted. You might still like things that you used to enjoy, but you just derive much less pleasure from it. Life becomes less rich, less full, and you might get little glimpses of joy, peace, happiness, and pleasure here and there, but you can't seem to reach them to the extent that you used to experience them. Now, it's unknown why anhedonia exists in the first place, but scientists speculate that it might be linked to changes in brain activity. Some believe it's due to a lack of dopamine, which is a chemical messenger or neurotransmitter made in the brain. And dopamine plays a role as a reward center and a feel-good chemical. Dopamine is responsible for allowing us to feel pleasure, satisfaction, motivation, and it's involved in movement, mood, sleep, motivation, learning, concentration, attention, and several bodily functions. Preliminary studies suggest that dopamine may be overactive in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which can interfere with pathways that control how we seek out rewards and how we experience those rewards. It's also important to mention oxytocin here, which oxytocin is referred to as the love hormone. And oxytocin impacts dopamine pathways to enhance feelings of reward and motivation. And another thing that plays a role here is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections, especially in response to learning or experience or even following an injury. This reorganization of synaptic connections can actually change the size of certain structures within the brain. Autopsies and brain scans of folks with anhedonia have shown that the following brain regions are actually smaller in their brains. The amygdala is smaller, and the amygdala is the part of the brain that creates emotional responses. The prefrontal cortex is smaller. This is behind the forehead, and this is the smart part of the brain that allows us to cognitively regulate our moods, to be compassionate and understanding, to make long-term goals, and to delay gratification. And finally, the hippocampus is smaller in the brains of folks with anhedonia. This is the region of the brain that functions as a highway for dopamine between pleasure, the pleasure processing part of the brain and the two areas of the brain that I just mentioned, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The hippocampus is also involved with memory. Now, what are risk factors? What would make you at a higher risk for experiencing anhedonia? Risk factors include having a family history of depression or major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, substance use, um, or even behavioral addictions, or coronary artery disease. Other risk factors could include a recent traumatic or stressful event, a history of abuse or neglect, an illness that has impacted the quality of your life, an eating disorder, and interestingly enough, being female, because for some reason, females are at a greater risk of experiencing anhedonia than males are. And there is no clear way to treat anhedonia, and that can be tricky. Sometimes the treatment for a related condition, such as depression, schizophrenia, or PTSD, for example, will resolve the anhedonia. 
but that's not always the case. Sometimes the medications used in treating the related illness can also exacerbate the anhedonia. And this is ironically enough, prescription medications for antidepressants. Go figure, the antidepressants are supposed to alleviate symptoms of depression, but they may actually play a role in blunting your emotions and causing the chemical changes in the brain that characterize anhedonia. So when medications and talk therapy aren't helpful, what can you do to address anhedonia? Well, other therapies can include ketamine therapy, ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy, TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, or even VNS, which is vagus nerve stimulation. Now, some of those are really treatments that you need to see your physician about, and they're reserved for more extreme cases. So what if you don't have an extreme case? There are some things that you can do on a more regular and ongoing basis that are not harmful and you can start to naturally and holistically impact the dopamine levels um, if, it, if these activities work. So let's go through some of them. Number one, aerobic and strength training. And why does this help? Well, aerobic and strength training and exercise can activate the growth of new brain cells and new brain cells make more connections for effective, the effective sending and receiving, receiving of signals within the brain. And these changes are most notable in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, two areas that I just mentioned that are hugely affected and actually get smaller as a result of anhedonia. And exercise actually creates dopamine. So that's why exercise can help. Paying attention to your nutrition is another good thing. And here's why. Eating protein-rich foods lower, um, excuse me, eating protein-rich foods because they contain amino acids that convert into dopamine is important. And saturated fats lower dopamine levels. So limit your saturated fats, increase your protein, and make sure that you're getting the vitamins that your body needs to create dopamine. Vitamins like iron, niacin, folate, and B6. Meditation can help because it decreases stress hormones like cortisol. Too much cortisol pumping through the body for too long can shrink structures in the brain that use dopamine to help regulate mood and emotion, which we've already talked about. When cortisol decreases, symptoms of anhedonia, likewise, also decrease. Meaningful social interactions can also help. It's not enough to just be around people. You must also feel close and connected to those people. According to Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, professor of psychology at Northeastern University, when dopamine is compromised, strong social relationships have the potential to improve your outcome. So social relationships can increase dopamine production. And finally, physical touch can decrease symptoms of anhedonia by creating oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone and it lowers cortisol. Physical connection with other humans might include hugs, holding hands, a massage, or getting massages on a regular basis, or even self-soothing behaviors can stimulate the production of oxytocin. So havening is an example of a self-soothing touch that can increase oxytocin production. And havening is starting with your hands crossed, our hands on your shoulders, arms crossed like an X across your chest. And I'm not putting a lot of pressure, but I'm also not lightly resting my hands. There's a firm but gentle pressure. And I'm putting, it's almost like a self hug. And then you kind of slowly move your hands from your shoulders down to your elbows. And you just do this over and over. And I would recommend doing this for two to three minutes, a couple times a day. So in five to six minutes to a day, if you can start to increase your dopamine production by increasing oxytocin and lowering cortisol, would you do this for yourself? Would you try it? And would you stick with it long enough to see if it works? Try it for 90 days and see what happens. All right, folks, I hope you have found this information helpful. 
And if you find it helpful, please like, shut, subscribe, and share. I'll see you next time, everyone. Happy self-discovery.